and we are good to go whenever you're ready. I was born April 27, 1927, on a farm about 80 miles outside of Montgomery, Alabama. My father was Obadiah Scott, and he was the 13th child out of 25. And his parents owned 300 acres of land filled with good timber. My mother, Bernice Scott, she only went to school up to third grade and she had a lovely voice and I inherited her voice. And we would sing together all the time. And my mother, she had a drum beat. Children, Edith, Coretta, Obadiah, when you get older, you make sure you get that education. That way, no one will be able to kick you around. And that way, you won't have to depend upon nobody, not even a man. We took her words to heart. Every day, we would go to school, walking up a, a dirt path, three miles to a one-room schoolhouse that met from December to March. And we had to pay for our books. But the white children, they had a yellow bus that came to their house that picked them up, took them to the school where there was a classroom for every grade, science room, libraries, playgrounds, everything you would want. And they didn't have to pay an extra dime whatsoever. It's not fair. We want to learn too, the same way. But my parents had a plan. Our school ended at sixth grade, but in Macon, in Marion, Alabama, there was Lincoln High. It was started in 1865 at the end of the Civil War by American Missionary Society, abolitionists, and ex-slaves. And it had white teachers and black teachers. My parents paid a black family to take care of us when it was our turn to go there because it was too far to walk. And Edith went first. And two years later, I joined her. It's the first time I was loved and nurtured by white people. Oh, we had white and black teachers, well-educated people. And they just poured their love and wisdom into us to shape us to be people who will grow up to make a difference in the world. Edith, she graduated at 12th grade, valedictorian of her class, and she won a scholarship to Antioch College in Ohio. And she was the first black student there. And two years later, I was valedictorian and I joined Edith at Antioch. When I got there, my roommates were two white girls. But after a while, we got along pretty well. <laughs> and I studied teaching and music. I wanted to go to oh, Paris, to the Metropolitan Opera House. That's where I was headed at. Oh, I was going to see. I was going to be another Marian Anderson because I was on the same program with Paul Robeson, you know, that football player from Rutgers. He became an actor and a wonderful singer, singing all around the world. And he told me, Coretta, you go all the way. You have what it takes to be a concert singer. <laughs> so that was my plan. Paris, Rome, Moscow, New York, Boston, Chicago. Nowhere in the South, except to say hello to my parents and get back out. <laughs> and after I graduated from Antioch, I won a scholarship to New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. So that January, I was deep into my studies in my room and my phone rings. Hello, this is Coretta. Oh, hello, Coretta. This is Mary Powell. You know, I'm the one who went to Spelman. Oh, yes, I know you, Mary. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. I just wanted to find out, do you know of Martin Luther King Jr.? Oh, no, I don't think I know him. He's a match 
peacemaker. Oh, well, let me tell you a little bit about him. I told him all about you and he wants to meet you, Coretta. His father is pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church. Martin graduated from Morehouse. Well, first of all, he graduated from high school at the age of 16. He graduated from Morehouse College when he was 19. He went on to Crozer Seminary in Philadelphia, and now he's at Boston University working on his PhD. And he really wants to meet you, Coretta. Oh, well, you know, I have my career. I had, this is the 1950s. I'm really not interested. Oh, but I forgot to tell you. He wants to be a Baptist minister. Oh, what? Oh, oh, oh. I, look, Mary, I'm from the AME church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. We are quiet and dignified in how we worship. I don't want to have anything to do with those loud Baptists. Besides, they're so narrow-minded. Oh, Coretta, he's not like that at all. He's so kind. He's so nice and charming. You just must have to meet him, please. And besides that, he's looking for someone who's from the South, who's full of charm and intelligence. Oh. All right, you could give him my number. A little while later, ring, ring. Hello, this is Coretta. Hello, Coretta. This is Martin Luther King Jr. And I've heard some wonderful things about you. I sure would like to meet you. Well, let me look. Oh, on Thursday, I have a couple hours between classes, maybe for lunch. Oh, that would be exciting. I look for me, I'd be driving a 1951 Chevy, green Chevy. All right, see you then. So on that day, I put on a powder blue wool suit and I covered up with my black wool jacket because it is January, it is Boston and it is drizzly. And I wait in front of the conservatory and there comes that nice looking 1951 green Chevy. But when he gets out, oh, he looks a little young. Um, and I did find out later that he's two years younger than me. And then he had shaved his mustache because he was pledging for the Alpha fraternity. <laughs> oh. He's a little short, but <laughs> we went on and got, got in the car and we went on to a restaurant that was not too far from campus that serves black people. And while we were there, he just kept looking at me oh, and I was enjoying my tea and the conversation was just wonderful. And we were talking about everything that was happening in the world. And he was surprised that I knew what was going on in the world. He thought I would just be interested in music. I said, no, Lincoln High School, Antioch College taught me to make a difference in the world. And he shared about Gandhi, his main man, Gandhi, who over in India, had ended the British rule that was brutal and oppressive. And there was not even a war, there was not a battle, there was not a gun that was fired. Oh no, it was peaceful marches, filling the jail cells, strikes. Those are the things that made the difference in India. And Martin felt like that's what he wanted to do in the South to end segregation. And I'm thinking, go ahead, Martin. <laughs> I'm headed to Paris. <laughs> but on the way home, at a stoplight, he said, Coretta, you have everything I want in a wife. What? You don't even know me. Oh, I could tell. You have intelligence, character, personality, and beauty. When can we get together again? <laughs> I'll have to check my schedule. <laughs> well, we did go out again on Saturday and on the way home, he talked about matrimony again. <laughs> Terry, 1950s, married women do not travel the world. And we continue to go out. Oh, 
we would go to the beach. <laughs> we went roller skating and we would dance. Martin was a smooth dancer. He could do the waltz, the foxtrot and the jitterbug. <laughs> but he said to me, Coretta, when I become a minister, I will give up dancing. <sighs> and Coretta, when I'm a minister, I don't want my wife to work outside of the house. <sighs> and Coretta, I plan to be a pastor in the South. That's where our people need me the most. <sighs> I can already feel the shackles of Jim Crow tight around my wrist and my ankle. What do I do? My sister Edith, she came and she said, girl, <laughs> marry that man. <laughs> now you won't have the career that you plan on having. No, 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 but you will have a career <laughs> with that man. Oh, yes. So slowly, I allowed myself to fall in love with him. And on June 18th, 1953, we were married on my parents' front lawn. His father, Daddy King is what we call his father. He officiated. And in the fall, we were back in Boston. I still had another year of college to do. And he had to still work on his dissertation for his PhD. And that first year, I was so busy, so steep in my studies. And he had a lighter schedule. So he would put on my apron. And he said, oh, this makes me look more like a man. <laughs> and he would get down to that kitchen. He would make fried chicken and collard greens. He would make cornbread. Oh, he could take a pig's ears, pig's snout, pig's feet, and make a meal fit for a king. <laughs> he was really good. And he did the washing, too. I'm not talking about a washing machine. No, washboard. <clears throat> and then he would hang it up in the corner of the kitchen by the stove. Oh, it was a good year. And in January, there was a couple of colleges wanting to be a professor, a dean, a couple of churches that wanted him to be their pastors. But there was this church in Montgomery, Alabama, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. They wanted him to be his pastor, their pastor. And he went down there and he came back and said, we're moving to Montgomery, Alabama in the fall. I prepared myself. I graduated in June and in September we were in Montgomery. And it wasn't that bad. No, it wasn't that bad at first. <laughs> and every week, we would work on his sermons. We would talk about the different points of what he was gonna say and I would be typing it up. But when he got up into the pulpit, he never had any notes with him. And finally, I became pregnant. And in November of 1955, I gave birth to our first child, Yolanda King, who we called Yoki. Oh, isn't she sweet? <sighs> Yes. And then two weeks later, our lives totally changed. That's when this woman, her name is, you know her name, Rosa Parks. She left her job as a seamstress downtown Montgomery, and she goes on to the bus. Now, in Montgomery, Alabama, when you get on the bus, you walk up the front steps, you put in your dime, you walk back down the steps, you go to the back door, you walk up the steps, and you sit back there behind the colored only section. That always enraged me. And on this night, Rosa Parks was sitting behind that sign and the front of the bus filled up with white folk and it was totally filled and the bus driver, and you know he was not saying it in a very nice voice. Oh, he was calling us all kinds of names to get on up and move on back for this white man to have a seat. And it was against segregation rules for a white man to sit next to 
a black person or to sit across the row from a black person. So everyone got up from that row, except for Rosa, she sat and she was arrested. And Martin that night, oh, he got the call and he's like, oh, what should I do? Is this what I should? Cause he liked to fast and pray before he made any big decisions, but it didn't take him too long. He was out there at the honky talks. He was at the, the theaters waiting for folks to come out of the theater. He was at the pool hall pa passing out flyers. And where did the flyers came from? A woman from our church, Joanne Gibson, had been trying to have a boycott of the bus system for years. And she had written up a plan. And we always almost did it last and earlier in March when another black child, she was only 15 years old and she was pregnant. She didn't get up off the bus either, but she was so young. And it was she just be crushed by the civil rights movement. But Rosa, she had already been trained on how to deal with injustice. So she was up there and she was arrested. She was found guilty. And on Monday morning, 50,000 Black people did not take the bus. No, we did not. I'm pregnant. I mean, I just had a baby. And so I can't go out there. But I'm out there on the phones and I'm organizing things and getting rides for people. And the people are out there in their buggies, horse and buggy, going down the streets of Montgomery, giddy up, giddy up, giddy up. Some of them had their mules and others had their wagons and their bikes. But 50,000 Black people walking, unified, organized, feeling good and proud because we're trying to end that injustice bus system. And in January, I was sitting on my couch with another woman by the name of Mary, because Martin always had someone at my house. When I heard something hit the wall of our front porch and it clattered down. And I said, Mary, get to the back. And we ran and it went boom, Woo! And we came back in and our whole living room was filled with smoke. The couch that we sat on was broken in half. There was a hole and our porch had fallen down. And when Martin came, I wondered, is he still going to be talking about nonviolence? Because all the neighbors were there and they had their rifles and their guns. They had the broken bottles and their knives. They were going to go and riot. But Martin, he said, go home. Do not hate the people who did this. Do not hate them. Go home. And they did. They went home. But that night, my father-in-law came from Atlanta. My father came and all night long, they were walking and talking and trying to get us to leave Montgomery and particularly for me to take the baby back to Atlanta or to do something. And his father, he's a big man. He's a powerful man. And Martin was looking like this, like a little scared schoolboy. And I sit there and I'm not going, I saw death. But my faith is rose up. And I realized for the first time that's I, that I was where I was supposed to be. I was not only married to my husband, but I was also married to the civil rights movement. I could sing on the stage and I did concerts and I raised millions of dollars for the civil rights movement through my singing. I knew I was in the right place. And 381 days, the Supreme Court said that the bus system segregated laws were unconstitutional. We won, we won, we won. Thank you, thank you so wow. much. Wow. Wonderful. Wow. So, um, wow. yeah, um, I think what I am going to ask is that we hold our comments until the very end, just so that um, we get to hear all the stories. Right. And I'm sorry if uh, you came after words and, and weren't here for the welcome. So welcome those of you that came in after Linda's uh, started. 
beautiful, beautiful story, Linda. And um, I'm also going to ask, and I'm sorry, Tellers, I forgot to make this announcement that the um, Tellers have asked that we refrain from chatting. Um, it's distracting to them while they're telling. So again, we can just hold our comments until the end. And without further ado, I am going to invite Magda, and let me see if I can find you, Magda, and spot uh, like you. In your video. This one? Yes. And spotlight you. So once again, I'm going to mute everyone and then you unmute yourself. I believe I'm unmuted correctly on my phone. <clears throat> Um, I actually don't hear you, so. How about now? Are now we ready for story number two? Wonderful. Absolutely fabulous. Well, um, what a week um, of getting ready for the holidays. And so it's a story that took place a long time ago in Christmas week. But let me tell you why I want to tell this story now, because I've been thinking about what it might be like to go back in time and to be able to do something that you really should have done back then, like when we're younger, but we just don't know. What if we could go back and do something as a younger self, something as simple as telling someone, thank you. Thanks for changing my life. So Christmas week, about 40 years ago, <laughs> December 1979, actually, I got to do just that. It was the first time that I traveled to Mexico. It was the summer of 1968. And we pulled into the cavernous main train station in the bustling heart of Mexico City. The train had traveled all the way from El Paso, Texas at the border. We were ready to get off. I found this person came up to me with a name that was mine and I followed him and he said, pointed that I should get on another bus. It was an overstuffed regional commuter bus that was heading north on the main highway towards the town of Querétaro, that's uh, further out in the state of Mexico. And sure enough, I got up and I saw this bus was packed. Folks heading home for the holidays, laborers, professionals, moms and kids, kids crying babies, you know, so many people and packages and poultry <laughs> pressed together. It was hot, still unusual for that time of year and, and dusty. So every window was cracked open as far as it could. And I, I, I sat braced in the, the third row on the aisle, trying to catch a breeze wilting next to this family of four. I just kind of kept my corner of the seat next to them. I was all dressed up. See, my mother had made sure I had my traveling outfit you know, a sleeveless button down dress, a uh, blouse. It, it, I think it was yellow with uh, tiny blue dots. I think we used to call them dotted Swiss. <laughs> it perfectly matched my navy blue cotton mini skirt. And, and oh, the new open toed summer sandals went to match it. I had this wavy black hair back then and bangs cut straight across and braces. <laughs> Just 14 years old I was, first time in Mexico and absolutely terrified. So after about two hours bouncing along, I, I was deposited as instructed at some bus shelter on the side of the main highway. In the outskirts of a small town, you could hear as the air brakes released, the bus driver turned around and yelled, Borotitlan, Borotitlan. And then he pointed straight at me. Mengo come quickly, come quickly. And he motioned me to get off. 
But by the time I stepped off the bus, somehow he had gotten out his side, gotten my suitcases from underneath and my matching blue suitcases were already waiting for me on the gravel platform. They had been magically retrieved. And not a minute to spare, that driver pulled that big bus on the road, groaning in it to gear and scuffing up this huge, thick cloud of dust all over. When it settled, I wiped my eyes off. There they were. I saw them for the first time, the whole Romero family. They were like their picture, uh, my host family waiting on the other side of the road, waving teens to toddlers piled in the back of a flatbed truck. And the littlest ones hid behind the older brothers and sisters who pointed at me and giggled and I, I froze. One of the daughters was about my age, dressed in her Sunday best, stepped forward to greet me with a broad smile and she said, Marsh, Marsh Beck, from Philadelphia and she showed me that my name was already nicely printed and I nodded and then she presented me on behalf of the family the largest bundle of gladiolas pale pink I had ever seen and then she leaned in and gave me a little kiss on both cheeks <laughs> rumpled damp from days of travel and and I worked hard to, to smile back politely as my mother would have expected. And I promptly forgot every word of Spanish I had just learned at the Spanish immersion language camp in Sedona the month before, except I knew to say, gracias. 14 indeed, still scared out of my wits. You see, it had been 40 other kids who'd gone to this summer camp and we were not allowed to speak English and we were immersed in language and culture. But the second half of the program was uh, to have the children and young adults go stay in a homestay so that you'd be invited into someone's home for four weeks so that it would stick. See, this idea, of going to language camp was my mom. She always wanted to know more than one language. And, and, and so she said, you know, you can't stay home because only people who stay home need to go to summer school. So we quickly looked at some program that I might go on and she found this camp and she did give me choice, Spanish or French. Four weeks intensive instruction. And then I had been dispatched to this town, Porotitlan, to live with the Romeros, Don Gonzalo, Don, Don Diego de Lupe, and their 11 children. The oldest was 17, down to a tiny nursing baby. Don Gonzalo owned one of the butcher shops in town off of the main square. We get to the house, <laughs> and they gave me my bed under a statue of the Virgin Mary and, you know, that somehow I wasn't quite sure <laughs> it, how that would be growing up Jewish. And I just felt honored and, and confused. And at the same time, so glad to be able to put my head down. And from that very first morning waking in the Romero's house, it got from being terrifying to being fabulous. It's that thing that you can do when you're younger and more pliable. It had been so far away from what I know. That first night, I burrowed my head deep into that single pillow so that I wouldn't upset anyone with my sobs. But by the second week, it was noisy and food and tears. They both managed to stay down in adventures and, and, and other kids and horseback rides and Oh, I don't think I cried again until they loaded my suitcases, the two perfectly matched blue ones, back on the regional bus to Mexico City. And I remember the night before, in perfect timing, I heard music outside my window. I had a real crush on a boy named Eloy. 
and he and his buddies came by on horseback with guitars and they sang to me and serenaded me. And we invited them in the house for hot chocolate and some snacks. It, it was sweet when he leaned over to say goodbye and he kissed me on the cheek and he said, uno, cuatro, tres. <laughs> Our secret code for I love you. <sighs> I didn't want to leave, but I did. And when you're 14 and 15 and 16, what was immediate tends to disappear. And those letters that we swapped on that bubble blue aerogram paper got fewer and fewer. And by my senior year in high school, it become a story and part of what I told of some place that I used to be and had been. But I went to college and became a primary care clinician, was working in a clinic in Brownsville, Texas, and fast forward, 1979. And my boyfriend at the time, we were in Mexico City during Christmas week, staying with some friends. And, you know, we're trying to think, well, what we could do during Christmas week? And he said, huh, why don't we go take an outing? We'll borrow a car. I said, I know where we could go. I wonder if we can find the Romero family. It just seemed like a good idea. And frankly, I hadn't thought very much about them except with appreciation, but that was then and I was growing up. But how hard could it be to find Borotitlan and this carneseria, his, his butcher shop? So sure enough, we borrowed the Peugeot, we got out on the highway towards Querétaro. We found out that Borotitlan by then had a toll booth it had gone from 5,000 to 15,000 people, made her way to the main square, the Sokolo. And there I went, closed my eyes and thought, I wonder where the house is. And after a few fits and starts, I walked to what I thought might be their home and knocked on the tall blue metal gate. Does the Romero family live here? And the woman said, lo siento, señorita, but you know, not anymore. They they all moved into the house behind the new butcher shop, back to the Socolo. Sure enough, we find the butcher shop marked with the Romero's name. And we walked in sometime around 12.30, 1 o'clock. The door jingled as we closed it behind. And there were three people behind the counter, maybe 14, 15, 17. All I know is what I asked them if the family was there and by any chance would they remember that someone once came from the United States to live with them for some time. Without hesitation, they got completely excited. They said, it's Mash, it's Mashita, she's back. She's back. Oh, how did you know? Know what? Well, today is our parents' 33rd wedding anniversary. You've come for the party. Come on, we're just getting ready to close down the shop. We're gonna go to the Pachango. You'll have to follow us. They'll be so happy to see you for today. Who knew? We got back in the Bujol. We followed it all the way through where the road became another road and then it became a dirt road in this old Ford pickup that we followed. But sure enough, you could see out in the distance in this open plain that someone had set up a party, lights flooding this open field, gazing, grazing cattle nearby. But sure enough, tables have been lined up end, 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 end covered with vinyl plastic and, uh, and flowers. And on every single table, there was a bottle of tequila and, and rum and, and vodka and salsas, red and green and accordion ranchero music filled the air. Even strung white lights promised that there might be dancing well into the night. You could smell the open flame barbacoa, the roasted pig spit and fatty barbecue smoke 
began to sting your eyes as we got out of the car. And that's when I saw her. She had not changed for a moment in my memory, as old as ever. So I walked up to her and I said, Buenas tardes, Dona Guadalupe, good afternoon. Congratulations, happy anniversary. Do you remember who I am? I will never forget how she searched my eyes. <gasps> and she cocked her head on one side and tears started brewing out of her crow feet in the corner of her eyes and down her leathery worn face. And she looked up at the sky and looked at me in the sky again. And she said ever so softly, thank you, God. Thank you for returning my other daughter to me and to us on this day. <laughs> and then she leaned in and gave me a soft kiss on one cheek and then the other. Gonzalo, Gonzalo, guess who's back? Guess who's back in that magical afternoon? All the brothers and sisters and their wives and husbands and their children and, and dogs and food. It was tumultuously joyful. After a while, I forgot who was with whom and, and all the stories we told. There were so many questions and toasts. I told them about studying Spanish and training at the university and working in hospitals and clinics with mothers and children. And that I was there because I had left something undone. It was getting dark, it was time to leave. I said to Don Miguel Lupe and Don Gonzalo's head table, I, I said to them as best I could, I'm so sorry for not being in touch, for not writing, for not, for not coming back sooner, for not being able to tell you then how you changed my life. And my Mexican mom takes my hands, my cheeks in her hands like this, and she says, Ay, mijita, don't worry. You're here. You're here now. Kissed me again and asked God to keep me safe. I said my goodbyes. It was the best Christmas week ever. And we took our leave and everybody had gathered and they were shouting and waving and waving and shouting as the Peugeot made its way back on that rutted road, scuffing up dust and scuffing up dust. You could hear them, adios, adios, see you, que se vayan bien, vayan con Dios. And we started back. And when I looked out the back one more time, it was all dust. And then they were gone again. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. Wonderful, wonderful story. Um, thank you again. And I'm gonna keep everyone on mute while I search for Rose in our crowd here. Um, our next storyteller coming up, Rose Owen with the Christmas guest. And Rose, I am going to spotlight you in your video and ask that you unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear, and I will mute myself. Thank you, Rose. The Christmas Guest. It has quite a history. It was written in 1883 by Ruben Salians in France. In 1885, Leo Tolstoy set the story in Russia and wrote it down. It was translated to English. It was translated back to French. It came to the United States and it was printed in a a uh, Christmas card. And Helen Steiner Rice turned it into a verse. Then Grandpa Jones recorded it, followed by Johnny Cash and Reba McIntyre and Andy Griffith. 
And no matter how many times that story was revised and rewritten, no matter how many times the characters' names were changed or where the location was changed, the message of the Christmas guest stayed the same. For of all the gifts, love is the best. I base my retelling on Leo Tolstoy's version. The Christmas Guest. It was a cold, bitter cold afternoon. The snow was falling gently down upon the ground. Martin Avedetich, the village cobbler, stood at the door of his house looking out. He watched the children running up and down the street and he listened to their excited cries. Tomorrow was Christmas and it was a time of excitement and joy. He could smell the smell of lovely Christmas dinners cooking in his neighbor's houses. Martin Avedetich had a smile on his face. His wrinkles, his smile wrinkles showed up very nicely. And there was a hint of sadness in his eyes behind his glasses. For Martin Avedetich was alone. His wife had died and his children had grown up and had moved away and he was alone for Christmas. But Christmas was a good time and he smiled as he closed the door and he went to the shutters on his window and he closed the shutters and he sat down. Now he did not often read in the Bible but today he picked up his Bible and with his finger he traced the words as he read the lines of the story of Jesus' birth. He read how Mary and Joseph had traveled from Nazareth to Bethlehem because all the world was to be taxed. And when they arrived there, there was no room in the inn and Jesus was born in a stable. And Martin stopped and thought about that. The savior of the world born in a stable? If they had come to my village, I would have invited them in. I would have given them my bed. It is big enough for two. I would have wrapped my patchwork quilt around the baby Jesus to keep him warm. And Martin continued to read. And he read of the wise men who came from the east following the star. And they came to the house where Jesus was and they brought him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. I don't have a gift for the Christ child, Martin thought. And then he thought and he walked over the shelf and he reached up onto the shelf and he brought down a small box, dusted off the top and he lifted off the lid and inside was a pair of tiny shoes, the best leather shoes that he had ever made. And he thought, I could give this to Jesus. This would be my gift. And he put the shoes back in the box and he put the box back on the shelf and he went to bed. Now, in that dream, in his dreaming, and as it happens when you come into a dream, you know instantly who it is. He heard the voice of Jesus. And Jesus said, Martin, tomorrow I will come to your house. Tomorrow I will visit you, but you will not know who I am. I will not tell you. Watch carefully, I will come. And when Martin woke up in the morning and he could see a ray of sunlight coming in through the crack of his shutters, he got out of his bed and he went and he opened the shutters and he looked out on the street. A blanket of snow spread across the street, across the sidewalks. There was no one there except the street sweeper. He was wearing ragged, thin clothes. And every so often he would put down his broom and rub his hands together to warm them up. And then he would pick up the broom again and continue sweeping. And Martin thought, who has to sweep the street on Christmas day? It's cold out there. And he went to the door and he opened the door and he said, come in, come in, come in and get warm. I have hot milk on the stove. I'm making crisp chocolate for my Christmas day breakfast. Come in and have some. And the street sweeper came in and he sat down and warmed his hands by the fire. And Martin handed him a mug with hot chocolate and he curled his hands around it and treasured the warmth in it. And they visited about this and that. And every so often Martin glanced over at the window and the street sweeper said, are you expecting someone? And so Martin Cho told him the story of how Jesus had said he was coming to his house. As the street sweeper got up from his chair 
and went to leave. And as he stood at the door, a chill wind came through the open door and Martin looked at his thin, thin clothes. And Martin walked over to the wall and he picked up his coat, his brand new coat. And he said, here, wear this, it will keep you warm. And as Martin closed the door, he thought, I can wear my old coat, it can be mended and will last for one more year. And then Martin tidies his house a little bit more and he put some cabbage soup on the stove to cook and he went to the window again and looked and he saw an old woman and she was hobbling down the street and her steps were slow and unsteady and in her arms she carried a bundle of sticks and as she got in front of Martin's door she stumbled and fell and the sticks went scattering everywhere and Martin rushed out and he picked her up and are you all right are you okay come in he said come in come in and get warm and he helped her to pick up the sticks and he brought her in and sat her by the fire and she warmed her hands by the fire and he gave her a bowl of cabbage soup to eat and after a while when she got ready to go she said god bless you martin god bless you for you have warmed more than my body you have warmed my heart and as she went to leave that chill wind came through the door again and martin looked at her and looked at the thin worn black shawl across her shoulders and he walked over to his bed and he took the patchwork quilt from off of his bed and he said here wrap this around your shoulders it will keep you warm and she laughed with a smile on her face and warmth in her heart now martin continued to watch through the day and the shadows grew longer and still christ had not come and at first he did not see her, but there was a young woman and she was kind of hugging next to the wall and next to the houses to shelter from the cold wind that blew the snow in swirls about her. And she was carrying something in her arms. And when she got closer, Martin could see that she carried in her arms a baby. And the baby's face was as sad and cold as its mother's. And Martin went to the door again and he said, come in, come in, warm yourself by my fire. And he warmed some milk and he said, here. And he took the baby from her lap and he said, I know how to take care of a child. I have had children of my own. And he took that child and he took the warm milk and he fed it spoonful by spoonful until the baby was full and giggled and laughed. And Martin looked down at the baby's bare feet. And then he walked over and he reached up his hands from the shelf and he brought down the box and the baby was sitting on his mother's lap and he lifted off the lid and he reached in and he pulled out those tiny shoes, the best shoes that he had ever made. And he gave them to the mother and he said, here, see if they will fit. And they fit perfectly. And the mother and the baby left warm and happy with smiles on their faces and Martin wave goodbye as they went on their way. And the shadows deepened and it began to get dark and Martin stood at the doorway and he watched his neighbors and his neighbors went up and down the streets. And Martin thought, is he coming? Is he coming? What will he come as? Will he be, will he be a child? Will he be a grown man? Will he come as the son of God or, or am I wrong and he is not coming? And Martin looked out and his neighbors went into their houses and they closed their doors. And there was no one on the street but the beggars. And Martin took them out soup and hunks of bread. And then they were gone too and the street was dark and cold. And Martin's heart was dark and cold. I guess he's not coming, Martin thought as he closed his door. And he closed his shutters. And then there was a light in the room and he heard a voice, Martin, Martin, I came. Three times my shadow crossed your door. Three times you gave me gifts. I was the street sweeper who wears your coat. I was the woman with the bundle of sticks that you fed. I was the mother with the baby in her arms and the shoes that are on her baby's feet. Three times I came to your door and three times you gave me a gift. 
And then Martin heard his voice say, and verily, verily, I say unto you, that if ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And Martin sat in his chair and he listened to the clock tick and joy filled his heart and he felt like jumping and laughing and shouting for joy and dancing. He came, he really came. And that is the story of the Christmas guest. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rose. Another wonderful, wonderful story. I'm going to unmute everyone.